In the early 1930s, a study began that was a corroboration between the U.S. Department of Health and the Tuskegee Institute located in Tuskegee, Alabama. Its purpose was to analyze the effects of untreated syphilis on African American males. Numerous times throughout the study, doctors promised the subjects they were providing them treatment, yet it was revealed in 1972 that this was all a lie, and that the U.S. Health Department had purposefully allowed patients they knew had syphilis to go untreated, while performing dangerous alternative treatment that provided no medical benefit. So today, let's take a look at the story behind one of the most infamous medical crimes of the 20th century. By the 1920s, STDs had become a public health crisis in the United States. Between the First World War and the Roaring Twenties, sexually transmitted disease rates spiked so dramatically, the U.S. government began a public initiative to encourage testing. Among the diseases they were most concerned about, Perhaps there was none as pressing as syphilis. Syphilis is a bacterial infection that typically starts as a small sore on the genitalia, before eventually spreading to the rest of the body. This rash will persist for months at a time before it disappears and the disease goes into its latent stage, where it remains in the body and can still be spread to sexual partners, but symptoms do not show. Or it enters its tertiary stage, which can cause horrific sores across the body, as well as extensive damage to organs that will eventually result in death. A woman infected with syphilis can pass the disease to her unborn child, which is known as congenital syphilis. And all of this happens in the latent stage where no symptoms are present. Penicillin has proved an effective treatment, particularly when caught early, but that wasn't invented until 1928 and didn't see widespread public use until the late 1940s. At the time, the best treatment available was bismuth and in severe cases mercury, which was very toxic to the person it was being administered to, causing a whole slew of health problems in and of itself while only proving to be mildly effective as a treatment. One of the groups most impacted by syphilis were poor rural African Americans. STD rates in these communities were disproportionately high compared to predominantly white communities. The reason for this was a perfect storm of bad socioeconomic conditions. Most doctors in the rural South were white men, and of course white Southern men in the early 20th century were overwhelmingly racist, and in some cases would simply refuse to treat black patients. In the instance a doctor wasn't racist, the cost of even a simple exam was prohibitively expensive, leading to numerous people who needed care not going because they simply couldn't afford it. Also, many members of these remote communities couldn't read or write. Unsurprisingly, this led to these people having little to no understanding of the actual disease behind their ailments. Often they would simply refer to it as quote, bad blood, a catch-all term that was coined by these communities to describe a wide variety of ailments from anemia to sickle cell to syphilis. During this time, one of the most proactive forces in assisting Southern black communities was the Rosenwald Fund, a charitable foundation established by American entrepreneur Julius Rosenwald in 1917. The fund's goal was to help impoverish Jewish and African American communities in the United States and it would spend over $40 million to this end before its money was depleted and it shut down in 1948. When Rosenwald initially started the foundation, it operated more like a savings account that he would withdraw cash from if and when he found a worthy cause. But as the organization grew in scope, it took inspiration from the Rockefeller Foundation and restructured so it could function like an official charity. One of the men brought in during the restructure was a Dr. Michael M. Davis, who was considered one of the foremost experts in the nation on the health needs of African American males. He looked at the staggering STD rates in poor Southern communities and thought he could do something. He proposed a massive project that would establish treatment facilities in multiple states and attack the problem of syphilis head on. To make the operation even more enticing for Rosenwald, 
Dr. Davis suggested that they also use the program to train African-American doctors and nurses. The Rosenwald Fund agreed to spend the $10,000 Dr. Davis estimated he would need to get the pilot program off the ground. They reached out to the U.S. Health Department to inquire about funding, and while U.S. Surgeon General Hugh Cummings was mixed on the idea, he ultimately decided it was worth trying. In 1929, the Rosenwald Fund, in cooperation with the U.S. government, launched their syphilis treatment program in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. For the next four years, it began a campaign of going community to community and conducting mass testing for syphilis. One barrier they ran up against almost immediately was the state governments in the South really did not care about the health and well-being of African Americans. This posed a problem, as not only did they need the cooperation of state officials to set up the actual infrastructure for the medical teams, but the Rosenwald Fund had a rule that if a state were to receive funds from them, they would need to match that funding dollar for dollar. As you can imagine, this really drove a wedge into things, as most southern states at the time were egregiously underfunding African American communities already, and convincing them to spend more was a Herculean task, to put it mildly. The sales pitch the Department of Health and the Rosenwald Fund used to get around this was an economic one. The program focused on sharecropping, so they could argue to state governments, of which many of their elected officials were landowners, that it would be in their economic interest to try and stomp out syphilis among their African-American workforce. The persuasion attempt worked, and the governments of each state agreed to match the Rosenwald Fund's donations. For now. In Alabama, state officials picked Macon County to be one of the first communities entered into the program. 81% of Macon County's population was black, and it was an ideal candidate for this project for a number of reasons. It was the location of the Tuskegee Institute, a prominent African-American college that was founded in 1881. The college offered to assist with the program, which was a major bonus given how ingrained they were within the Macon County community. The institute also featured a fully staffed and functioning hospital, which it offered to donate to the use of the study. County officials, from the mayor to the physicians who sat on the health board, were enthusiastic about the plan, so there was less of a chance that bad actors would sabotage the study and the team sent there to conduct the study would be getting 100% support. State officials in Alabama knew Macon County had a major problem with syphilis. The official figure was a staggering 36% infection rate, which was the highest in the state and would end up being the highest of any of the cities the program surveyed. The syphilis problem was so bad compared to other counties that the Rosenwald Fund offered additional funding specifically to try and combat it. Additional funding that the state of Alabama, of course, had to match. They reluctantly agreed, and in 1930, doctors from both the Department of Health and the Rosenwald Fund began seeing patients at the Tuskegee Institute. The goal was to diagnose and treat syphilis to try and drive down the infection rate. These treatments included mercury shots, rubs, and pills, which, as we've already discussed, came with their own laundry list of issues. Dangerous as it is, mercury does offer mild relief of syphilis symptoms and was embraced by many of the patients who received it. Sorely missing from the project, though, was education. Healthcare officials didn't even bother trying to educate the population of Macon County on what syphilis was, steps to take and prevent it, and the fact that it could be transferred through the uterus to an unborn baby. Basically, doctors just told the patients they were being treated for bad blood, and that the shots and rubs were to treat that specifically. This resulted in a language barrier, because the doctors were saying bad blood specifically in reference to syphilis, but the residents of Macon County were using it in a much broader sense. To them, bad blood was the explanation for a bunch of different diseases, none of which they understood the specifics of. And it was no different than having a bad back or bad teeth. Bad blood was just something that happened, no different than the common cold. So they were treating people for syphilis, 
but not trying to explain what syphilis was or steps they could take to prevent it. Which, you know, is gonna make it kind of hard to drive the infection rate down. Overall, the initial aims of the project were admirable, and it was of course more successful than the previous approach of not doing anything. The cost though was much higher than the Rosenwald Fund predicted it would be. Mercury wasn't cheap, and with syphilis being a much greater problem than they anticipated it would be, the fund's burn rate on the project ballooned, which, if you'll remember, also meant the state's match ballooned. By 1932, with the Great Depression in full swing and the economies of all the states the project was working with getting hammered by it, these states decided to cut their portion of the funding to save money. This had the ripple effect of causing the Rosenwald Fund to also withdraw from the syphilis treatment program leaving all the data and medical infrastructure in the hands of the Department of Health. They decided to shut down most of the treatment programs, as without funding from other sources, there was no way they could afford to treat everyone for syphilis. But they had an idea specifically for Macon County. They wanted to observe the effects of syphilis on someone when left untreated. Not for an extended period of time, just something like six months and if given the opportunity, try testing some alternative treatments they thought might work for syphilis. Since the citizens of Macon County already trusted the Tuskegee Institute, they would conduct the study there. And they would tell a teeny tiny lie and say to the patients that they were still treating their bad blood. Now, lying to patients about the treatment you are giving them is obviously horrendously unethical and illegal. But officials, even those who worked at the Tuskegee Institute, justified it because a medical examination where your doctor is lying to you about what they're injecting you with and what they're examining you for is still a medical examination. And that was something most of these residents would never be able to afford otherwise. They selected a group of 600 men, 399 of which had tested positive for latent syphilis the other 201 who had tested negative were used as a control group. In exchange for participating in the study, these men were given free meals, medical exams, and eerily enough, burial insurance. Doctors would observe symptoms in some and test experimental treatment on others. Often this would entail unnecessary and painful examinations such as spinal taps and injections or pills from things like arsenic and other speculative treatments for syphilis. That initial six months turned into 30 years, and despite the study revealing very little that wasn't already known about the effects of syphilis, the doctors involved in the study were very effective at lobbying for more funding and convincing the health department it was a worthwhile endeavor. The men participating in the study effectively had their health care completely under the control of the study's team the entire three decades, and the Department of Health went through a lot to keep it that way, including barring the men from military service during the Second World War and discouraging them from seeking outside care. As immoral as all this was, by 1947 it was downright evil, when penicillin was shown to effectively treat syphilis and the men never received it or were informed about its existence. Remember, these men still believed they were getting treated for bad blood, but for 25 years, hundreds of people who were living day to day with syphilis were purposely withheld the treatment so they could continue to be used as guinea pigs in an experiment. As a result, not only did many of them die an entirely preventable death, but they would also go on to spread a preventable infection to others. In 1972, a whistleblower named Peter Buxton contacted the Associated Press and revealed the existence of the program to the world, and people were outraged. The Department of Health shut down the study, and the patients, the 74 who were still alive, finally got proper treatment. A lawsuit was filed against the US government in 1973 by the patients and their families, which resulted in a $9 million settlement. The government also established the Tuskegee Health Benefit Program 
which paid for the victims and their families' health care for the rest of their lives. In 1992, then-President Bill Clinton formally apologized to the survivors and their families. By that time, only three men who participated in the study were still alive, and all three have since passed away. The damage this did to the black community's trust of the medical industry has taken decades to repair, with African Americans still on average being more likely to distrust doctors and hospitals and more likely to believe medical conspiracy theories about things like vaccines and COVID-19. Whether that relationship will ever be repaired fully remains to be seen. But one thing for sure is the dark legacy left behind by the Tuskegee experiments will not be forgotten anytime soon. <laughs>